everybody. Welcome to the Art of Tracking radio show. Tracking is still alive and well. Join us as we interview master trackers from around the world. We'll hear their stories, their secrets. So tune in and enjoy all you hear. Welcome. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, tonight we have Michael Patrick on. Uh, Michael Patrick owns Maine uh, Primitive Skills Survival School. Uh, Michael's been in the uh, business for a long time. This year he uh, celebrates 25 years of uh, sharing and uh, teaching the skills. We're really glad to have him on. He has a passion for tracking and, and all the primitive skills and that uh, He's a, a great teacher, and he, he has a, a YouTube channel that's just outstanding and full of uh, a lot of information, uh, and we're glad to have him. How are you doing tonight, Mike? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on your show. Oh, this is great. Uh, we uh, These shows don't last very long, so we always ask that uh, anybody can always come back on because, you know, we get started talking about tracking and time flies. Actually, this show is only 15 minutes. I think I made a mistake when I was doing that. Uh, but how's it going? It's going great. We were just uh, out tapping the trees, getting ready for the sap to flow, and came across some fisher tracks. Of course, that was a distraction for about three and a half hours, just following the fisher and <laughs> watching how it <laughs> stalked snowshoe hares and it cornered and ate a porcupine on the ridge over across the way. So. Uh, it's great tracking conditions right now, but I don't think it's going to last. I think we're going to have a warm spell, and the snow is going to dissipate, and then we're going to be back to tracking in leaf litter and pine thatch. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, right after the snow melts, it's usually uh, kind of damp, and it's okay for tracking, right? It is. I love sharing in the snow because you could relay to people who you know they see the tracks. Uh, things like variations in track pattern and increases and decreases in speed, direction change, even head movement, especially in the canines, is really evident in the uh, tracks. We had a really great uh, experience yesterday. We were tracking a bobcat, and they were trying to decide whether it was male or female, and we came up to a place where it perched on a rock, and it was clearly visible that it was a male because of the way it perched on the rock. Everything was very detailed. I'll just leave it at that. Uh as far as head turns, is that best read in the front feet? Exactly. Most of the alternate walkers, as you know, the front paws or feet are larger than the back because they have to take the burden of the head and shoulders. But they also uh, display for us a shift to the left or the right of the center line of travel when they start looking in those directions. Wow. That's cool. What's your favorite uh, aspect of tracking, sir? Gosh, I would say uh, it's a toss-up between trailing and interpretation. They're so closely related. And trailing, it's always a challenge. You think you got it nailed in, in beech leaves and pine thatch until there's a section that's really firm or dry or uh, hasn't been especially weathered and it's consistent in its moisture content. There's always that roadblock of, filling in the gaps between the tracks that you're following, the blank spot, and the tracks that continue on down the line. I learned at an early age in my tracking career to never skip track. We were, we were uh, sent out on a, an actual tracking mission where a farmer had lost one of its Shetland ponies, and it was about three hours before the sun had set. And we traveled uh, three miles, maybe a little bit more or less, but about three miles on this trail, trying to mark every track, but starting to get lazy and a little anxious as it was getting darker. And at one point, we even found where the bridle had wrapped around a tree and the horse had torn itself free. So we were pretty confident, right up to the point where we saw the clear print of a moose calf on the trail we oh. had been following. And at no time did we realize where one track went one way and where we picked up the moose calf. We just got lazy. So, you know, learning those lessons not only helps you to follow the animal that you want, let's say it's a deer you shot and it, it grows through a deer yard with thousands of tracks, but it also increases your track literacy so you can track more and more at a, a walk or a run or even in your vehicle 
and see every track in that connect the dot game that we call trailing. Wow. And uh, as far as interpretation, uh, how heavily do you rely on things like pressure releases, gates? Uh, tell me a little bit oh, about right. that. Well, when I was growing up in, in Forked River, New Jersey, that entire area is flat and covered in sand. So pressure releases, you can actually read them at a regular, you know, usually every day you're going to run into pressure releases. Here in Maine, we have clay-rich, loamy, fluffy soil, rich in rock substrates. Uh, it's it's very rare that you're going to find pressure releases that are going to be consistent. So I rely here on track patterns and track clusters. You know, the idea that an animal will tee, you know, create a tee with its tracks as it stops and looks both ways before crossing a tote road or a paved road. Um, those things are really valuable. And I rely on them almost 90% of the time as far as trying to figure out whether an animal is being pushed out of or pulled toward an area, whether it's moving slower or faster than its harmonic gait, and really trying to get into the mindset of the animal. Yes, sir. We we love that push-pull uh, theory and practice that quite a bit. Uh, now, I, I know you're a, a teacher and a great one at that, and we've talked a little bit on Facebook here and there, but do you have any uh, particular strategies when you're teaching beginner and intermediate trackers? Yes. Um, we use uh, the uh, eight directions model that Wilderness Awareness School uses for its mentoring programs. We apply it to the tracking with the first art of tracking being track identification. Now, this can be applied to someone who's fresh off the pavement and thought tracking was something you used to do on an old VCR, but it could also be applied to that search and rescue tracker or that seasoned wildlife tracker, tracker who's plateaued at, oh, well, that's a, that's a bobcat and that's a gray fox because. You know, those are, that, those are depths of understanding of who. Deeper than that is track identification to the point of saying, yeah, sure, it's a raccoon, but how old is it? What is its experience level or its baseline of caution? Is it male or female? Are there any injuries? So now you're starting to profile an individual within the species. We do that with man tracking and lost people all the time. It can be applied to animals as well. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, okay. And then uh, so uh, you, have, you you know, say it's day three of a tracking intensive. Uh, I wonder what might be uh, the schedule for the day. Okay, so by day three, they've already set up their track aging boxes. They've uh, established their sit areas. What we do first thing in the morning, even before breakfast, is they go out for 45 minutes, and there's an exercise in reading the baseline bird behavior so that they could use concentric ring studies to determine any disturbances in the area. They're also, even though they don't quite realize it yet, because they're mapping those areas, they're gaining an understanding of edge areas and larder principles, where if there's blackberries or strawberries out, how that influences the prey indicator species that come in to feed on those those items, and then that in turn also influences those fur-bearing animals that we, we may want to hunt or trap, like fox, bobcat, even the weasels. So they do their sit areas, and they come out, and they put uh, marks in their track aging boxes. I ask them to sit there for 15 minutes of good quality time and pour their senses into the marks that they're making at every meal time. From that, well, day three, we're probably working on interpretation and trailing. So it could be that we're in the tracking shed, which is a building that is, the, the floor is sand, and we'll play uh, games like the blanket game, where you make three tracks, and on your fourth track, you make a direction change. Then you put a blanket over that fourth track, and then the tracking team comes in, and using the pressure releases of that third track, they place a marker on top of the blanket where they believe the heel strike of the next track is. Then you pull away the blanket and see who is most accurate and discuss their theories and why they did or did not pan out. Um, so, you know, that's that's up to lunchtime, and it's that intense until sometimes 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night when we're lighting campfires or field tracking blindfolded through certain substrates. It's always about pushing uh, each person's edge and involving all of their sensory input as we track. Man, that is outstanding. I love this. Uh, going into this uh, radio show, was there anything you wanted to talk about for sure or? 
Well, gosh, I didn't know where to begin. I, I, I was excited to share where our school started down in the Pine Barrens. Um, I grew up, you know, where there was just acres and acres of wooded area. And my first job at the Boy Scout camp, it's called SIDA now, but it was Brookville Boy Scout Reservation, was as Wilderness Survival Merit Badge Counselor, only because the older kids got fired for being stupid and partying across the street. But here I yeah. am, 15 years old, and uh, doing what I loved. And that was the start of where we're at now. Where we're at now, we see these skills as something greater than just the total sum of a certain or a specific skill set. Bow drill, it's not just about fire. We know that. It's about learning the trees, learning what works and what doesn't, and having a, a real respect for everything from flint and steel to lighters to just sitting around a campfire. Tracking is no different. We're at a point where we're finding the people who are deep in the matrix, knowing there's something more to life than the 9-to-5 treadmill, getting them outside in the mud and the dirt and the cold and the mosquitoes, and allowing them to make authentic communication through tracking with the landscape. And it's not just, you know, foo-foo dust. It's communication that fills your belly or your freezer for your family. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I love that. And I appreciate your uh, your uh, philosophy and methodology because uh, I'm geared that way myself. You know, there's different styles out there, but there's some of us who know uh, there's uh, better styles than others. <laughs> so, uh, well... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, didn't to... I was going to say, uh, one of the things that I've learned through all of this is I don't know anything. And every time I wake up, I'm the, I'm the, I'm at the first day of the, of the dojo experience. You know, not even earning my white belt yet. As soon as I believe I know something, there's the universe has, or the landscape has a way of humbling me hard. So I can't afford to know anything. Someone will tell me, oh, are you the, are you a tracking expert? And I was like, I don't think there is such a thing, but. Someday, maybe, I'll grow up to be one, but not today, because I still want to learn it. And it's that it's that passion and that attitude, I think, it, that we share collectively. You know, things of the earth make us feel small and humble. And when we learn how to read that manuscript out there, um, that isn't written by the hand of man. That's written by something far bigger than I can comprehend. And it's written and rewritten every day masterfully. And we could learn how to tap into that. It changes people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's all. I guess it's all about dirt time. No matter how long we've been doing it. That's it, right there. Yes, sir. Uh, I I have to apologize. I made a mistake when I was scheduling this episode, and instead of having a thirty-minute episode, it looks like we had a fifteen-minute episode. So I I would I'm going to ask you right now if you will come back and we can talk a lot more. That would be fantastic. Yeah, good. That would be great. I'm uh, honored to uh, have been asked to be on the show, and uh, I, I wish everybody well. Get outside and track. Share stories with, with your loved ones about the experience. In fact, take people out there you care about and have shared story with them. It's the way our ancestors did it. It's the way we should pass it on to the future generations. Yes, this is it's great. It's great. Uh, this is uh, this uh, tracking radio show is new. I'm just kind of getting it launched. It's been. It's been going for about uh, two months now, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you got to be part. Of, or I'm glad you decided to be part of it. You didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was looking forward to it. Hey, Michael, thank you so much, and uh, please, uh, I'll, I'll, I want to have you on again because we didn't even get a chance to dig in very deep. Oh, that sounds fantastic! And if you could send me through Facebook uh, the link to your radio show, I'd like to 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 broadcast out there that you're doing this. This is amazing work you're doing, and I'd like people to share in the experience, if that's all right with you. Oh, cool. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. And uh, visit Michael Douglas at uh, Maine Primitive Skills School. He's all over the Internet, all over uh, YouTube videos are outstanding. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Take care. You too.